Please join me in the prayer of illumination. Gracious God, our way in the wilderness, guide us by your word through these 40 days and minister to us with your Holy Spirit so that we may be reformed and renewed through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, Pastor Ron, let's get up again. you to know that you never have to apologize for telling a joke. I do it all the time. They're pretty bad sometimes. I've got several. I've already told Dan this morning. i got a couple that are really lame this morning, but that don't stop me. And it hasn't stopped me in the past, and it's not going to stop me now. I'm just getting further right along. Uh, I really believe, as, as you mentioned, Tim, that I believe that um, people didn't come to Christ as they did in droves because he was a harder guy to get along with. I think he was one of those people, all of us know people like that, that we're just attracted to them. They're the kind of people that, that we want to be around. And, and that I'm, I'm convinced, uh, as reading about him so many times, that I'm convinced that's the kind of man he was. They were just drawn to him. They, they were drawn to him by the, literally by the thousands. And so uh, I, I have a really good feeling that that's exactly the reason why, is because he was a happy man and enjoyed life and enjoyed and loved people. And that's what we should all do. Okay, Matthew 6, 1 through 6, 16 through 21. If you have your Bibles, you're welcome to call, call along with me. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for they have never, no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your own may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Do I tell you, they have received the reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. 16. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces as to show others that they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who is seated in secret will reward you. Do not store up yourselves treasures on earth, for where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there is your heart will be also. Read that again. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's a fact we all know, isn't it? It's an old story, but it bears repeating. An armed robber held up a French priest on a dark, dark back street in Paris and demanded his wallet. As the priest opened his coat to reach for his wallet, the thief caught sight of the, his clerical collar and immediately apologized. Never mind, Father, I didn't realize you were a priest. I'll be on my way. The priest was relieved, of course, and good naturedly offered the man a cigar. No thank you, Father, the robber said. I gave up smoking for Lent. <laughs> Not really good, but not really bad. One of the hollow traditions of Lent is that we should give up something, something we enjoy for the duration of the sacred season. Usually it means like something like chocolate or beer or soda or food of some kind that we really like. We think that would be just a trick. Some other alleged vice. This, of course, is open to us a multitude of lame jokes. And I'm not done. One civic-minded individual said he gave up taxes for Lent. Another said he gave up his New Year's resolution for Lent. Comedian Steve Colbert, Colbert, who I understand is a Sunday school teacher at his local Catholic church, you know that? He joked that he was giving up being a Catholic for Lent. 
People laugh at the idea of giving up things for Lent, but the idea originally was to share in the suffering of Christ. Christ gave his life for us. We have to give up something to show our devotion to it. It makes sense. However, under the best circumstances, this practice has never worked very well. Dean Snyder, the senior minister of Foundry Methodist Church in our nation's capital, said that he was doing some research on religion and eating. One little fact he came, ran across was that in medieval times, monks gave up butter and lard and fat for Lent. They had an Ash Wednesday ceremony called Burying the Fat, in which they would put butter in a casket, hold a funeral service, and bury the casket. They gave up butter, lard, and fat because this made them constipated. And they, this, they felt, was their way of sharing in the suffering of Christ. That's as lame as it gets. A serious response to this idea of making a sacrifice during Lent has been many Christians fast during Lent. How many of you folks have ever fasted? None of you? I you did Okay, I have at various times in my life. It's, it's a wonderful, powerful thing. If you want to do it sometime, I would encourage you to do that. But, you know, you show, just as it said in the Bible, as I read to you, you got to be careful. That can get out of hand. I've known people that were very proud of the fact that they fasted. And they want to make sure everybody saw that they were fasting, just like we talked about this morning. Medical experts are, however, divided on the idea of fasting. Some think it's a good idea, some don't. However, many people report that fasting has brought them closer to God, and I think there's some truth in that. Because you're denying yourself. And anytime you deny yourself as a people, it's a tough thing to do, and it makes us realize how really demanding we are about our lives. According to John Maxwell in his book, Partners in Prayer, fasting played a major role in a great awakening that swept both America and England in the 1800s. If you want to read something really spectacular, read about that awakening. Amazing, really. John Wesley, founder of the Methodist movement, and his brother Charles and other fellow believers regularly fast and pray. John Wesley so believed in his practice that he urged early Methodists to fast and pray every Wednesday and Friday. He felt so strongly about fasting those two days a week that he refused to ordain anyone in Methodism who wouldn't agree to do it. I suspect that there are many Methodist pastors who are happy that this is no longer a requirement for ordination, and I'm one of them. It always it seemed to me like that's just counterproductive there. We're talking about you have to fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Fasting is something you should do voluntarily on your own at any time. So that's one reason I am against it in that regard. But we don't have to do that anymore to be ordained. Maxwell lists several Christian greats for whom fasting was a regular part of their lives. Now listen to these good folks. Martin Luther, John Calvin, who has played a huge role in a Presbyterian movement. Read about that sometime. John Knox, Jonathan Edwards, Matthew Henry, Charles Finney, Andrew Murray, and many others. Many people have benefited spiritually from this practice. One person you might be surprised to know the fact has fast on a regular basis and always before a, a great decision that she had to make was a young lady by the name of Dolly Parton. You know that? Regular fasting. But even a good thing like fasting can be abused. In our lesson from the gospel, we hear our Lord say, I'm going to read it to you again. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. You can visualize this, can't you? Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so it should not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Jesus, spoke, Jesus is not saying do not fast here. In fact, he appears to be explicitly endorsing the practice of fasting. He even gives directions for how about to do it. When you fast, he says, put oil on your head and wash your face. In other words, fasting is good, but not if it is an idle show of your religious, religiosity. That word comes out. I've always appreciated the word of one of the church fathers when he asked, 
When it comes to fasting, and this is his question, do you fast? Give me proof of it by your works. If you see a poor man, take pity on him. If you see a friend being honored, do not envy him. Do not let only your, your mouth only fast, but also the eye and the ear and the feet and the hands and all the members of your body. Let the hands fast by being free of laziness. Let the feet fast by ceasing to run after sin. Let the eyes fast by disciplining them to not to glare at which is sinful. Let the ear fast by not listening to evil talk and gossip. Let the mouth fast from foul words and unjust criticism. For what good is it if we abstain from birds and fish, but bite and devour our brothers? And folks, that's hitting the nail squarely on the head. Even a good thing like fasting can and will be abused. We gotta be very careful with fasting, but it's a powerful thing. The central purpose of Lent that we're in bed, involved in is to bring us back to God. That's what it's all about. That is the message of our gospel from the epistle. If fasting or making small personal sacrifice brings you closer to God, that's all well and good. But it's important for not to lose sight of why we fast or why we make personal sacrifices. Paul writes in the church of Corinth. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The point of Lent is that we shall be reconciled with God, that we have to be wandered away from, we've wandered away from him, and that we might come home. We may indicate our desire for reconciliation by fasting or by making a sacrifice during Lent, but there's always that in there, isn't there? But to say we need to be reconciled to God is to confess that all of us, to some degree, are estranged from God. And I hope you realize that. Now, I know there are some members of this congregation who live very close to God. And I am in awe of their spiritual commitment. But let's not kid ourselves. None of us is perfect. We're all sinners. There are gaps in our lives, emotions that will not heal, resentments that will never, will still fester, prejudices that come to the surface under stress. It's all there in every one of us. In a sense, we're like snowflakes. I read this this week, couldn't already believe it. I'm still not sure it's true, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. And if it's not true, take me to task, go ahead. In a sense, we're like snowflakes. I read that snowflakes are so beautiful and white and look so pure, as they do, but every snowflake has a tiny piece of dust at its core. And so do we. That's why Lent is so important for us. It is to help us deal with that tiny particle of dust that keeps us from perfectly reflecting Christ's image. There's that tiny piece of dust in all of us. And we all know that. C.S. Lewis once noted that there are two central truths about human nature. I'm going to read this to you. It's, uh, I had to struggle with it a little bit to understand exactly all of it, but I'm going to read it once, and that's all you're going to get. But, I'm, but you know, listen, he writes, Human beings all over the earth have this curious idea that they ought to behave in a certain way and cannot get rid of it. Secondly, they do not know and not, they do not in fact behave in that way. In other words, they know that they have. They know the law of nature, but they break it. These two facts, he continues, are the foundation of all clear thinking about ourselves and the universe that we live in. Did you get that? It's true, isn't it? It may not be fashionable to use the word sin these days. It, they tell us it's too archaic. Still is the central fact of human nature. No matter who we are, no matter how hard we try, we have not arrived at perfection. Right? I haven't. I don't know anybody has. In fact, when I was old, that was a long time ago. 
Children sing a little nursery rhyme, you may remember. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put Humpty dead. And that's true of our lives. We are a broken people, and the only hope we have to be put back together again is for God to touch our lives. We can't put ourselves back together, folks. We just can't put ourselves back together again, but God can. And I've seen it happen not only in my own life, but in the lives of a lot of other people through the years. There was a young man in Wisconsin named John. John was kind of scary, actually. He was in his early 20s and was very active in MMA or mixed martial arts. He liked to fight anywhere, anytime, with anybody. One day his family went to a church event, a community picnic, held by a church in his community. The pastor of that church talked to John and invited him to church. John wasn't very interested, to say the least. Some time went by, and one day John showed up at church, accompanied by his three-year-old son. Something happened to John in that church, something really beautiful and powerful. The Word of God took root and grew in John's heart. He went to church some more, took some instructional classes, finally joined the church. One Sunday, John walked into church late, Really late, almost at sermon time. After the service, his pastor asked why he was so late. John said, well, he got up that morning and his car wouldn't start. He tried to fix it, but he couldn't. So John got out his 10-speed bike, bundled up his kid, and paddled five miles in the freezing Wisconsin temperatures because nothing was going to stop him from being in worship. Folks, I've seen this happen in people's lives. John had something missing in his life. He couldn't put himself back together again, but you see, God did. Now, John is not perfect, but he's still growing. He's growing the same way that you and I hope to grow. Don't we? And finally, we are to reconcile with God. When we are, we will be more easily reconciled with one another. I mean, they just go hand in hand. This is my understanding. Reconciliation with your, our neighbor always goes with reconciliation with God. Hand in hand. Final story. And I see Anthony Robinson in his book, what the What's Theology Got to Do With It? Tricky title. Tell the story about a Palestinian Christian priest, Elias Kankor. It is said that Cancor tired of presiding at the sacrament of communion in his congregation. The reason was that he knew that many of his parishioners hated each other. Some would not talk with one another year, had talked in years, even decades, and bore grudges dating back to previous generations. We've seen that in the news that went. It's been going on for a thousand years. One Sunday, Father Cancor locked and barred the doors of the church. Then he told the congregation that he would no, had no intention of residing at the service at sacrament or, or unlocking the door until those at odds with one another confessed their sins and offered forgiveness and made peace. He wasn't going to do it. Now what followed after a stunned silence was nothing short of remarkable. A policeman got to his feet, confessed his misdeeds, and asked forgiveness. Others followed. When the Lord's Supper was finally celebrated, it was no longer a mockery. It was a sacrament in which members of the congregation recognized one another as the body of Christ. Folks, our world hungers, hungers for an authentic sign of Christian devotion. If you stop, take this for what it's worth. If you stop at a fast food facility, or go to a restaurant on your way home. Let me challenge you. Don't be impatient with the server. Show genuine Christian love and goodwill in action. Small act. It's not going to go down to history or change anything necessarily. 
But it's a beginning. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled with your neighbor. If you have someone that you're having trouble with or have trouble with or whatever, work it out. It's possible. Work it out. When we show genuine Christian love, it's not a sign that we think ourselves better than others. Exactly the opposite. We are sinners dependent upon God's grace. Fast in the way that Christ recommended. Fast by your good works. By your love. Because that's what that's all about. Let's pray together. Father, we recognize those areas of our lives that we need to work on. Every one of us. And we just pray that you'll help us to do that very thing. Because so many times in the past we tried it on our own and we failed. Because we realize we can't do it on our own. And so that's why we come to you. Be with us. Amen. Hymn number 355.